Good morning. It is uh, 1034 a.m. on Monday, September 2nd, 2019. I'm Christiana Ellis, and I've been eh, distracted this morning. Uh, I recently got up, but I've been kind of poking around trying to decide what I'm going to do today. It is Labor Day, and I think it's important on Labor Day to briefly, at least, uh, discuss that this holiday exists because of labor unions who fought to get us uh, get worker protections so that uh, we're not exploited at least any more than, you know, doing the best we can. <laughs> um, I, you know, if I had thought about that, I could have made it more coherent. But the, uh, the primary thing that I was thinking I was going to talk about today is that yesterday, as part of the Fathom Events series, I went to go see Lawrence of Arabia on the big screen. <clears throat> now, Lawrence of Arabia is one of the, uh, you know, one of the Hollywood epics, which is a subgenre of movie that they don't really make anymore. It's just, it kind of almost can't exist, I think. But uh, certainly in the days of, you know, before CGI, it still had, you know, enormous landscape vistas and, you know, shots with thousands of people and, a, and that sort of thing. And, uh, boy, seeing it on the big screen is, is certainly a remarkable uh, experience because there are shots in this movie where, like, there's a notable shot where you have a character looking off into the distance and seeing nothing but a flat horizon until there's just the tiniest little black speck. What is that? Can you see it? It's just the tiniest little thing just in the center of the screen. And it and there's a long period of time where you're waiting for it to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until you can see that it's a person approaching. And boy, you know, this is exactly the uh, the shot that Roger Ebert talks about in his um, great movies review of this movie. And yeah, on I mean, there's a long period of that shot where on a TV screen, or certainly certainly, if you had a smaller screen or it wasn't at 4K or something like that, there would be a significant part of that shot where you just couldn't see anything at all. You would not be able to make out that little black speck. But on the big screen, and it just, there's so many landscapes in this movie where this movie does something which uh, a lot of movies don't do much anymore, which is to depict the human characters as very small against an enormous landscape. Lots of long shots where, you know, the if, if this is the vertical frame of the camera, the little human people are just tiny, tiny little pieces on the screen. Now, you might get an occasional shot like that in the, you know, in, in a modern movie, but not as often, not as often. And it's and so it, it stood out, especially on the big screen. Now, one of the things that I want to talk about in terms of the movie itself, as opposed to just the experience of seeing it on a big screen, which basically I highly recommend. I think it was it definitely was the best way to see this movie for sure. Uh, but the movie itself, like one of the things that I vaguely remembered about it. I had seen it before, and when I had, it was when I was in my early 20s, and I was seeing it because it's one of those big movies that you're supposed to see, right? If you're a film buff, you should see Lawrence of Arabia. And I vaguely recall, like, I think the way I probably would have described it is that I like the first half more than the second half, because it gets a little bit boring in the second half, and uh, it's it's pretty good and it's and I would probably just talk about some of those same landscape uh, elements and that sort of thing uh, but I think looking at it now when I have sort of a broader longer perspective on many things including you know appreciation of cinema arts uh, but also just a more understanding of people it's interesting to reflect now that I thought then that the second half was more boring. When what I see it 
now is that the first half is the exciting adventure half. The second half is where the real world consequences of doing the sorts of things that Lawrence is doing catch up with him and it stops being fun. That's, I think, what I was reacting to is that I wanted it to be fun. I was having fun in that first half. And then when the story stops being fun, I checked out because I wasn't able to appreciate fully the darker elements of it. Now, one of the things that is certainly true about this movie when viewed through a modern lens, and to some extent, you know, even the lens of when it was made, is that it certainly has many elements of what we call now the white savior tropes, which is to say, you know, someone, uh, you know, goes into a foreign culture, it's almost always a white someone, goes into a foreign culture, does all of their things better than they do, and basically teaches those savages how to, you know, he, you know, he appreciates them. He's the one that sees how great they are, and he helps them, you know, uh, you know, uh, defeat their oppressors and that sort of thing. And it's interesting because it certainly does have many of those elements. Uh, Lawrence does like there's a there's a, an exchange where some of his fellow English British officers are talking about Lawrence, and one of them asks, "Has he gone native?" And the other one says, "No, I think he would if he could, though." And it's interesting, uh, it's an interesting exchange because that is part of what happens in the second half of the movie is that he increasingly starts to realize that him sort of playing at becoming an Arab, going native, so to speak, realizes how superficial that actually is. You know, they gave him you know, clothes of their style, but it's also, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because they do respect him and they do admire him. He does help them accomplish things that they would not have without him. But the scene where they give him the Arab style clothes, as opposed to his, his British uniform. I mean, everyone's kind of laughing at him. Not like in a mean way, but a, as in a look how funny it is to see this white guy dressed up like we are. Not like they like him. They think this is fun. They're not malicious, but they are amused by the contrast. And so it is interesting, I think, that, you know, where he has one of his biggest... Um, missteps in the second half of the movie is he's really started to buy into his own hype, the legend, where he thinks he's going to be able to just essentially walk into a foreign occupied city and not stand out as a white guy with blue eyes who's six foot two in, uh, you know, just because he's wearing, uh, you know, uh, Arabian style clothes. And of course they pick him out immediately the there's some stuff with um where the subtext implies some uh homosexual attraction on the part of the turkish general who uh you know basically uh stares him down before he's uh punished and of course there's all sorts of subtext about whether of course lawrence himself is is gay uh but unfortunately, because of the time in which it was made, that stuff has to stay deep, deep subtext. It's, and it's hard to really draw any conclusions about what the movie might be trying to say with some of that stuff. But in any event, he is essentially found out, not caught as being Lawrence, but the, it, the assumption is that he's a deserter, and therefore he is beaten um, also for you know, striking the general. And so he, he's not caught as being... Lawrence, but he is caught and he is beaten badly and uh, and it's a very traumatic experience for him. And part of that whole thing is he realizes the color of his skin means that he will never actually be one of them in the way that he feels like he wants to. 
And that really changes everything for him and it starts him kind of spiraling. And so, and, and then there are also parts of the movie where they actually interrogate his own motives for, you know, wanting to go native and that sort of thing. And it's interesting because I think that the movie itself interrogates those tropes. You know, it's like, why are you here? Are you here because we're a little people that you think you can play with? Is that what is that what's happening? And uh, then you have essentially several other characters having open, explicit conversations about how they're just planning to use him. You know, he it's like, okay, well, he wants to do this. We will use him as long as he's useful. And he's kind of taken advantage of in some ways. And it's interesting just because. I think that the second half of the movie is where everything gets complex. And it's a little bit like how Fight Club, the movie, has two halves. One, where they make all of the nihilism and stuff that Tyler Durden has going on look kind of cool. And then the second half, where it's revealed to be actually horrible. And what always happens is the people who are... Okay, there are exceptions, but many of the people who would cite Fight Club as one of their favorite movies really only actually like the first half and don't actually absorb any of the meaning of the second half, and they come away quoting all of Tyler Durden's lines from the first half of the movie before the movie is trying to tell them that that's all stupid. Anyway, so it occurs to me that when I watched this movie before, having thought of the second half as boring was really actually just me not understanding it. But it's also, I think, a valid question to ask about any work of art that if it can't make itself understood, is it successful? I mean, you know, far be it from me to try to say that Lawrence of Arabia is not a successful work of art because I didn't understand it 20 years ago. But <laughs> in any event, I think it's an amazing movie. It's a masterpiece of cinema and I appreciated it a lot more this time than the last time I saw it, not least because I saw it on the big screen, which is an experience that I recommend to anyone who is interested in classic film. So with that, I'm going to leave it here and talk to you all tomorrow for five more minutes.